I call to order the Gladstone City Council work session for Tuesday, January 24th, 2023 at 531 p.m. The City of Gladstone is abiding by guidelines set forth in House Bill 2560, which requires the governing body of the public body to the extent reasonably possible to make all meetings accessible remotely through technological means. Therefore, this meeting will be open to the public both in person and virtually using the Zoom platform. The Zoom access instructions can be found on the meeting agenda. Members of the City Council, staff, and the public all have access to this call. Council work sessions generally do not include public participation or business from the audience. We have three items on the agenda tonight. Uh, a presentation from State Representative Vanessa Hartman, a report and presentation on voter approved public works facility project, and a discussion regarding city liaison appointments. Um, I understand that uh, you know the voters of Oregon uh, have a low tolerance for unexcused absences by their state legislature these days. We passed something on that back in November. And uh, so uh, uh, Anessa Hartman, our representative, is doing her duty in Salem and is on her way. She had a meeting this afternoon. She expects to be here about six o'clock. So we will move her item later in the agenda. And we will begin uh, with a report on the presentation of our public works facility project. So I will ask staff to make introductions and Mayor, get us you started. Want to do a roll call. Let's do a roll call. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, count oh, okay, Councillor Huckabee? Here. Councillor Alexander? Yes. Councillor Reichel? Here. Councillor Roberts? Here. Councillor Garlington? Here. Mayor Milch? Present. Let the record show that uh, Councillor Garlington is present on Zoom. She wasn't feeling well and did us the courtesy of, of keeping us all separated. Let's stand for the flag salute before we begin our agenda. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and now staff. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council. We're very excited to bring you this update on a project where, as you know, in our current environment, it is very difficult to not only get public projects completed, but private as well. And so before I hand it over to our project manager and our architect and construction team, I wanted to just provide a little bit of background. The reason why this is coming before you tonight is because we have four new elected officials that we are transitioning into having to make some decisions on this project. At your February 14th city council meeting, we will be asking you to approve a $4.4 million guaranteed maximum price contract. I'm very pleased to say that today, this afternoon, we received the bid documents and came in right at $4.4 million. And that is because we are doing what's called a progressive design approach. And that is where you select the contractor and the architect at the same time. And what the architect designs, the contractor says they can build. So once you approve this guaranteed maximum price contract in February, there will be no changes to that project cost. So just to give you a little bit of history, uh, the existing public works building is over 50 years old. It lacks space for public works construction meetings and development planning meetings. It has no public restrooms and no sufficient office space for the employees. In 2016, staff temporarily, in 2016, utilized the non-ADA compliant modular unit that was moved on site. We're still in that six years later. In 2017, a needs assessment was conducted and it was concluded that the facility needs are insufficient for the current staff. Specifically, there needs to be locker facilities with showers due to hazardous materials like sewage that our employees sometimes are working with. Uh, we need restrooms, coordination meeting room, office spaces, a lunchroom and storage space. Additionally, I wanna point out that our public works employees are first responders with the police and fire emergency responders during inclement weather and natural disasters. 
So in November 2021, a ballot measure was approved by the citizens of Gladstone authorizing us to borrow funds to construct this building. The city retained a project manager, Kim Knox, who many of you may know also assisted us with the Gladstone Civic Center. That project came in on time and budget. We also came to the city council and they approved a contract for completing phase one of the progressive design build project with PNC Construction Scott Edwards Architects. Tonight we have Brandon for Scott Edwards Architect and Shanna will be representing PNC Construction. I'm going to have Kim and Brandon come up and talk a little bit about what the next steps are in the process. And we have a few slides that we want to show you. And I also have our public works director, Darren Canaparoli here, if you have any questions tonight. Thank you. Jackie, greetings. So nice to see a bunch of new faces. Had a great time working with the faces that were up there before that we built that desk for. And now it's great to see the, the more, more, uh, more folks being involved in the process. And thank you all for, and congratulations on your elections. It's uh, very exciting that you've, uh, doing your public service for your community. It's uh, That's a wonderful thing. Um, so Kim Knox, I'm from Shields Obletz Johnson. We are a private uh, consulting firm. We do project management and owner's rep services in the region. As Jackie said, uh, we helped uh, navigate, help Jackie and her team navigate the construction of this building, um, did a similar process to what we did here in terms of the progressive design build where we hire, as Jackie said, the architect and contractor are a, come as a team, they report to each other, and uh, we don't get we don't get this, we get this, right? So that's that's the, I don't know how you put that in the public record when I do hand gestures, but but that's the intent here is to, to really come together with a team and out of the gate, we were very clear with the team that in the advertisement in selecting a team uh, that the city has $4.4 million, that's it, right? It's, you know, you, we're gonna have to squeeze, uh, we're, once the toothpaste is out, we can't get it back in the tube, right? It's like, we're fitting that. And so it's in, um, so August, as Jackie said, the team was selected. In October, the team came out with like what they called a 50% preliminary design that uh, based on some additional reconnaissance they did in terms of reviewing the building code, once they were selected, they were able to kind of look at the building code, look at the zoning code, um, doing some on-site structural mechanical observations of the building. And uh, then they came up with a 50% uh, design uh, preliminary pricing set. That, which tends to be, as Jackie referred to earlier, like many projects right now was over budget. So, but we did present that to you. We said, here's where we are, here's where we're headed. And since October, uh, the team has been working diligently to, to squeeze everything that, that we're wanting into a, um, into that toothpaste tube of $4.4 million. And uh, we plan to, and as Jackie said, today we got the preliminary uh, uh, proposal from the design build team that meets that that uh, target and the next over the next week or so we're going to go through that with a fine tune cut to fine tooth comb or a brush and we're going to uh, give it a real look and make sure that we understand uh, it's based on very preliminary information the design still needs to be refined quite a bit but we want to make sure that we all are on the same page about what's in there uh, more will be discovered as more design works you know what's going to fit exactly between the wall of the bathroom and the reception desk those kinds of things still need to be figured out and the design team will keep working um, with that but as we do uh, the progressive design build process um, once we authorize this guaranteed maximum price, the team has a clear path to get the building designed and built for you. So it's a, uh it, you turn on the ignition switch, you, you, we adjust along the way to make sure that the city's getting the pieces that are priority for them that will make uh, your public works staff operate well and make them happy. Um, and uh, so that's what will be coming to you on February 14th is that package, like here's the go package, can we go? So uh, that's my little two cents. I'm gonna turn it over now to Brandon who can show you the pretty pictures. Sure, thank you. So again, Brandon Dole with uh, Scott Edwards Architecture. Glad to be here. Um, we did throw a few slides together for you tonight, mainly just kind of help orient you with where we are in the process, what that design looks like. 
Um, I'm assuming you all can see the slide behind you, but but I am going to point just a little bit. Um, so our site, as I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar, is that gold ring around the center. That's the public works operations yard. Um, we're currently focusing on that building there to the um, northeast that's adjacent to the trailer. Um, that is our focus. The project is also going to have, um, will include a, uh, right-of-way improvements along Portland Ave, and we're looking at some improvements as well along uh, Watts Street. So the, the key takeaway here is all the work is happening here in the building with um, some work happening at the front edge. Next slide. This, when we started at the onset of this project, there was a lot of conversation on what does this building look like? And of course, it sits adjacent to this building, the Civic Center, which is a, a beautiful building. And so we wanna make sure that we're paying homage to that, but also providing as much as we can within the budget. Right? Our goal is to get as much as we can, best bang for the buck. And so what I want you to understand is the building that sits there today is the building that we are gonna reuse. Right, The shape and form of the building will look fairly similar to what you have here, but it will be new. Um, the in and out driveway approaches, the parking along the, the, the right of way along the building as well, all of that configuration will remain. It will essentially be uh, brought up to conformance at this point. The uh, vehicle access in and out of the operations yard will remain the same. The gate and fence will slide in terms of its location, but the use, the way you, uh, you know, approach the site, um, traverse the site, all of that is remaining as it is today. Um, this drawing here is our civil plan. So our civil partners are um, HHPR. Their focus, again, is a lot of the, um, the frontage improvements here, utility connections, helping us lay out parking, fencing, um, and this is the new configuration. So uh, right-of-way, the sidewalk is all being brought up to conformance. We're going to have a nice sidewalk, uh, planter strip with street trees. We will improve the driveway access. We will improve the parking, making sure that all like turn radiuses, vehicle access, and all that is not impeded. We will have landscaping around the building and around the parking as well. And you can see in the plan um, that the, the fencing, the, the gate will relocate um, to the west side of the building. Here's a floor plan of that building. If you were familiar with some of the early studies, this might look consistent. We tried very hard and very diligently to build on the work that the city had already had already performed and completed. Um, our, in our mind, we made just improvements on that plan. Um, some of the key components is a, a nice public lobby that is welcoming to the public, but also provides that security uh, for city staff. Uh, they do have some um, visitor presence and you know some traffic here, not a lot, but some that we wanna be cautious and aware of. We have a bank of offices um, along the, um, it's plant, it's sheet north, but it's technically along the right of way, Portland Avenue. We have some conferencing, which is geared more towards public. Um, we have crew rooms right now. So we're, we're gonna build out two crew rooms that'll house the two different divisions, supervisors as well. Um, let's see, what else can I talk about here? We have a break room for staff that will have access to a, an outdoor um, area. We have locker room, we have some changing rooms, laundry facility and toilets. Um, the, one of the, the major changes that we actually made in the plan was we went from a gender specific locker room configuration to a gender neutral, um, which is efficient in terms of space and plumbing fixtures. When you think of this building, the big the, the big picture here is we're we're going to reuse the existing building. That's that's the strategy in, in maximizing the four point four and coming in under budget. What we are going to walk away from, even though we are reusing the building, is we're going to walk away providing the city with a structurally with a code compliant building from a seismic standpoint, energy standpoint, um, and so the building will essentially be new in our mind. We are going to um, upgrade the frame, the pre-engineered metal building component of the frame. All the structure that's above grade will have improved connections, will we'll in increase the capacity of the roof. Um, and we will do the same with the structure that's below grade. So we're going to introduce some new foundations, improve connections to the foundation, and again, bringing the building up to a current building code. We're going to use, um, in terms of materiality, we're going to use a, um, a very nice material. We're going to use what's called an insulated metal panel. 
And so what that is, is basically um, a panel, an exterior grade panel that has all of the uh, weather, um, weather barrier, all of your uh, vapor barrier, all of the assembly that would go in a normally wood framed wall, like a, a wall you have in this building, all within that skin. And what that is gonna do is allow us to create a new building, a new look, again, bring it up to energy conformance, energy code. Um, and also again, best bang for buck, right? Um, we're bringing in new openings, new windows, new doors and whatnot. Here's some elevation views of that building. And so again, you can see some articulation in the finishes. Most of the building, 90% of the building will look consistent throughout, but we're gonna articulate openings with a similar panel, but has some texture to it, some different color to it. Um, introduce operable openings. Um, anywhere where a person will be sitting, we'll have operable openings to bring in fresh air. And then we are tacking on, the only new square footage to the building is the vestibule out front. And then here's the other views of that building. So again, you can see it will have the sh same shape, form and size, but essentially will be a new building for you. That is it. And Brandon, that's considered a pitched roof, correct? That's correct. Thank it's you. A, it's a gabled roof. Yes. yes. Yep. And I just want to just circle back on just to um, commend the, the team that you have working for you here at, at PNC Construction, Scott Edwards, between Brandon's, Brandon's efforts, Chana Frederick behind us from PNC, and <clears throat> Jeremiah Dodson, the project manager for PNC. They've done an outstanding job. They really get Gladstone, right? So you don't have to argue about... Although there was one argument about a sign graphic and Brandon wanted to do some goofy stuff, but he was a pretty, he was squashed, right? And Darren and wow. Jackie had some great, you know, very clear direction on that. But anyway, you have a great team that I'm really excited uh, to be working with here. Um, and I, and uh, your staff has been outstanding and being very clear what the objectives are and really right sizing this, the, the direction for the project. Um, the one other thing I do want to say and pick up on one thing that Jackie said, we are, we're, we're, we're squeezing this into the $4.4 million budget. That said, there's always a risk to an owner and we experienced it on this side. There are things called discoveries that there's nothing, there's no way the contractor could have known about a particular condition. That is an owner responsibility, right? So we've done as best as we can with the information we have to suss out all of that. But there's always a possibility that a discovery and contractually, the city's obligated to pay for those things. So I just wanted to, uh, I, I hope we're not going to come back to you with any of those. But I just wanted to, to, to give some clarity. You know, I don't want to come back with a bunch of people with their hands on their hips saying, but you said. So anyway, I just uh, want to get that out there. So we're available for questions if you have any. I would like to add, though, that Kim has a fear of contaminated soil <laughs> because that did happen here. And so she has to disclose that we've built in some contingencies. We've done some testing. And if it's an issue, we'll have a solution for it. But I understand why Kim wants to bring that to your attention. Yeah, we've essentially done a lot of due diligence. We've dug in the soils. We've GPR'd the foundations. We've got a good idea of what kind of reinforcing size of footings. So we've tried to unpeel that onion as best as we can. But until we actually start putting shovels in the dirt, we're not 100% certain. Would you expect that any contamination or something that you would find would be the result of just the site of the building as opposed to its prior use. This is not something that, that accumulated correct. because it was used as a public works facility. That's correct, yes. Okay. It's a soil composition issue. I yeah. see, okay. I just wanna say, you know, we, we value uh, people who take initiative and, and creativity. And for every idea that got squashed, I'm sure you'll come up with many that we will <laughs> greatly appreciate and, and embrace. So uh, we look forward to working with you. One question I have, the way you've described this as, um, it, it almost sounds to the layperson like a remodel of an existing facility. And the experience most people have of that is maybe doing a home remodel of some kind. You know, you remodel your kitchen and you have to live out of the bathroom for a while and <laughs> wash your dishes in the tub and that sort of thing. Uh, to what extent will the, will the usage of the building be affected uh, during the construction process? That might be more of a question for you. Um, but uh, I know a lot of it has to do with vehicles that are outside. You're talking about the interior portion. That's correct. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. It's a, it's a question we face with a lot of public projects. You know, will you be operational during construction? This building will go down, right? The, uh, the 
the construction trailer that has, you know, um, admin staff in it now will go away and we will start peeling back that, that building. So the building won't be operational for the eight months it's in construction the site will be operational. So the contractor, their subcontractors will work with the city to make sure that that you know, choreographing happens. Uh, but this building in itself is going to get completely peeled back. So at, at some point, you will be able to come to the site and see nothing but that frame sticking out in air, and then we'll work backwards and putting it back together. So that home remodel experience would be taking your house all the way down to studs, <laughs> pulling all the electrical, pulling all the mechanical and building it right back. All right. It's good to have that visual. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. People will ask and it's good for us to kind of know. Well, and I was going to also offer if you want to see any of the creative ideas that have been squashed. <laughs> since, since Aaron it's came. only one that we squashed, <laughs> but I do think that public works director has a little bit more to expand on where the operations piece will go. Okay. Yeah, so we will still be on site in the same location. We're just going to move to the back property. There's some buildings back there. Uh, the old fire building that uh, used to house fire equipment and stuff like that will move into that building. And then the, the uh, old evidence room, which we're currently occupied, half of our staff is currently there, will we'll work out of those two buildings. The construction trailer that's there now will move to the back side of the, the property along Watts. So we'll be fully functional out of the same location. It just, we won't be accessing off of Portland. It'll be off of Watts. Okay, so uh, the timing of, of, of this and the new police station plus the moving of the fire department may have helped in, in some regard to, to your ability to do that. Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, we would have, ultimately, we would have had to move off site. Yeah. And that's not good for anybody. So, all right. Very good. Good information. So, uh, counselors, I'm sure you may have questions. So, I'll start uh, with number one, Counselor Huckabee. No questions. All right. Counselor Hi. Alexander. Yeah, when we're like when we built this one, which you already, you know. Oh, I thought I was loud enough. Okay. Um, how deep do you dig for the contamination? Because I know when, you know, what happened here. Yeah. And so I just wondered, is there a certain. We're not digging for contamination. No, I know. Okay. Well, how. We're how... digging for foundations. Okay. Right. Just to... So how deep do you go <laughs> so you avoid. Yeah, that's a, into that. yeah. that's a great question. So we, um, the team brings on a geotechnical engineer, right? The guys that are guys or gals that are inept to digging in the dirt. Um, they come out and they do test bores. So we had them do two test bores on site. Again, we, we had an idea that there may be potential issues with the soils based on the work that was done here. So we felt that if we took a test bore on the north and on the south side of the existing building, that would at least give us a good idea. And I think uh, the borings probably went down about 20 feet is probably a good estimate without having the report in front of me. It's probably about 20 to 30 feet. And what they found was just soft, silty clay. Okay. Yeah. So no contamination. Yeah. Great. And you did a great job on this place. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that turns out. Thank you. Thank you. I have no questions, but thank you. Councillor Roberts? No. Councillor Garlington? I just have one or two. Um, so I just think this is great. I'm super excited to see what the building looks like in the end, and hopefully it will be a great addition to what's going on on Portland Avenue. Um, when I had talked to uh, Dar um, Jim, about three years ago, he said one of the issues down there is if there was an accident of some sort, they didn't have enough shower and laundry facilities to cover all the people. Show me the shower facilities because I'm not getting it. Yes, no, it's a great question. We can do that. Yeah, just a moment. Oops. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, so yes. Okay, so floor plan. If you look here, um, let's see, between grids A and B, uh, towards grid number two. So this is the locker room, if you will. There is a toilet room, plan yes. north that has a shower in it. So this little square here is a shower with an ADA bench adjacent. This is the toilet fixture and the lab, the sink. Um, so we are bringing in one shower to the facility. And then we have a second toilet room here with an additional changing facility here. And that, that 
that creates. When you say the, here, tell me the number you're on. Um, let's see here. So it is right of grid line B. You'll see the two little boxes. One's labeled toilet. The one right below it isn't labeled, but that is the changing room. That's a changing room, but not a shower. Not a shower. So, so one, you still only have one shower for all the people that work in that building? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Well, I'm going to question that, but um, I'll defer to the powers that be. I just don't, I just wonder if there truly if there is an accident, where are you going to shower? How many employees do you have down there? Quickly. Well, currently we have one shower that is, to be honest with you, more than sufficient. Um, there's currently nine front end staff, ten front end staff, uh -huh. uh, and the shower that we have currently is more than sufficient. Where we really lack is in uh, toilet space currently. We currently have one one toilet in the main building that we're doing the the remodel on, and then we ha currently have a portable toilet that is out back that uh, staff uses for that type of work. That sounds really cold. I, I apologize <laughs> for that. Well, um, to add, to add to that too, maybe yeah. I if I could. Yeah. The way we look at that contamination and the work that the crew members do, we see it. We see the initial cleansing or rinsing of all that debris off happening outside the building. Right. Okay. So the, the west entrance, the let's see, the door that is um, along grid line two. If you could imagine there's a boot wash at that door. So say I'm a I'm a crew member and I, you know, I get something on me. I ideally am spraying that off at that amenity, at that facility. And then I come into the building. And as I come into the building, I have the, the opportunity to go into the locker room or into the laundry room. And in the laundry room itself, we have a nice, you know, nice, nice large industrial sink, wash bins, um, a dry hanging area, and, and obviously the washer and dryer. So anything that may be left on me that didn't come off at the boot wash would ideally stop at the laundry room. And the whole idea behind the gender neutral locker room is that anytime someone has to go down to their, their skimpies, they would do that behind a closed door, right? Brings all the crew into one space, builds culture, builds camaraderie, but also provides you the means to make the change um, in terms of your wardrobe if needed. Hopefully that okay. helped. Counselor Garland. Well, if Darren feels like that's enough, then I'm I'm all good with it. I just I only asked because Jim had said one of the big issues was that if there was an accident, how was everyone going to shower in a you know in a, in a decent amount of time and 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 have access to that? So, but if Darren's good with it, I'm good with it. That's all. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Counselor Garlington. Uh, are there any other additional comments that you want to make? Are there any things that came up as you were listening that, that you'd like to add to this report? We're excited. We're very excited. <laughs> well, one of the things we did at our, at our council goal setting was, you know, emphasize the importance of being prepared for making some of these decisions that we as a counselor are, are, are required to make. And uh, having this kind of a briefing in advance in a work session really helps us come in feeling well informed and uh, you know that we know that our decision is based on good information. So we appreciate your being here. We appreciate the work that you've put into this project already and that, and that uh, hopefully based on a decision we make next month, you will continue to be putting into it. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I see we're right about at 6 p.m. Uh, have we heard anything from our legislator? Not since we started. She said that her direction said 6 p.m. arrival, but that's probably before if there was traffic. So okay. if you want to start your next item and when she comes, you can take a pause. We can. That sounds that sounds like a good, good way okay. to do. OK, uh, if you want to turn to item three, the council liaison appointments. Um, I know from having watched, uh, you know, first of the year meetings in the past, sometimes these are appointments, uh, you know, made by the decision of the mayor himself or herself. Um, I'd like it to be a little bit more 
uh, collaborative decisions on this. Uh, and so we can kind of uh, look at these. Uh, none of you have told me in advance if there are specific areas that you want to serve. So I'd, I'd like to hear that from you tonight. Um, I have some, some idea of where you'd like to be serving or not serving. Uh, for example, uh, um, Councillor Roberts, you raised some questions about data about uh, uh, traffic collisions uh, in the city over the last few years. Uh, it sounds like you have an interest in traffic safety, uh, as we all should, I think. Uh, should I interpret that to mean an interest in serving as a council liaison to the Traffic Safety Commission? I was interested in what they were talking about in their meetings and getting a better idea of how that affects our city, but that is not the uh, appointment I had in mind. Oh, okay. All right. Just good to know. <laughs> um, I suppose while I have the mic, I'll throw my hat in the ring sure. then for the water infrastructure. I'm All right. interested in replacing Councillor Tracy. All right. Well, that's a good one, an important one. Uh, he has taken, uh, I, I believe he sits on the board of one of the commissions. Is that correct? Uh, North Clackamas County Water Commission and Gladstone is currently the chair. So this is a very important appointment for this position, yes. And will the person we appointed be automatically a member of that commission and the chair of that that's commission? That's correct. Yes, okay. and I know that former Councillor Tracy was willing to mentor whoever took on that role um, before their meeting. They're having a meeting, I believe, this week. So technically, if you appoint in February, their next meeting would be in March. So there is time for mentoring and discussing the transition into that appointment. Okay, well, that is one of the positions where the person currently serving in that role is no longer on the council. Yes. So that's one we would keep open. So that's good to have that information. Um, so are there members of the council who would be interested in that traffic safety uh, advisory board? I'd be, I'd be working. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't sure um i'd be happy to do it for me i'm happy to help wherever is needed it's more of a schedule all right fitting it into my life versus a personal preference but all i right. am willing to do traffic safety that's helpful to get that that willingness mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't mind being a backup Okay. Or even if we just share it, if there's a scheduling issue, one of us can go. Well, one of the things I was thinking of is, is maybe for most of these, if possible, to try to get two people assigned. Yeah. So that if there, uh, if one of you has a schedule conflict or if it's an issue where it'd be helpful to get a different perspectives, yeah. um, we could do that. I attended last night and there's some useful information shared in it. So. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for going. So let me, let me jot this down. I got to find it here. Okay. So. Councillor Alexander, have you given thought to um, commit? Let me let me speak about the one one area where you're serving right now. Um, we had not before had a, a council liaison to the police department itself. I know that most of our council liaison are liaisons to committees, stud, uh, not student citizen advisory committees uh, that we have. Uh, and you and I had a conversation about this a while back. It's a little bit awkward to put you in the position of being a council liaison to someone for whom the council does not have direct supervision as a council. The council oversees the city administrator. The city administ administrator oversees the police chief. The police chief would be in an awkward position of not knowing how to relate to a council member liaisoning with him or his department versus how to relate to the city administrator. So my feeling on this matter is uh, perhaps uh, unless at some time we develop a police oversight board like some cities have, uh, that we dispense with having a council liaison to the police department. Um, Administrator Betts, what has been your experience in other cities about how this has worked and, and whether that's consistent with what most cities do in your experience? Uh, I would say that because of what you just 
mentioned the fact that there's not an actual oversight committee with the police department, this is an anomaly. And when we had the fire department, there was also a liaison to the, the fire chief. If you look at all of your liaison committees that you have, that is the only one that doesn't relate to some type of a committee. So what you're saying is actually true. What do other cities do? I, I don't know. I would have to research that. But unless they had an oversight committee, typically they don't have elected officials that report to department heads or vice versa. Okay. Well, that's what I thought. And that's what I want to avoid. I, I don't want uh, a department head to feel that they have conflicting uh, 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 obligations to to different people, to elected officials and to staff. Uh, the chain of command needs to be pretty clear. And for department heads, it needs to be to the city administrator and then the city administrator to the uh, city council. And a lot of history that I've researched, the reason for the liaisons is because monthly reports weren't getting done and people didn't really know what was happening in departments. And I think that's what triggered the initial, let's have an elected official uh, communicate with the fire chief and police chief to, to know more what's going on. But it is different when there's not a committee involved with having a liaison. Now, the one area we have that's a little different from that is we do talk about joint fire services oversight committee. Yes. Uh, because we've made that transition to having Clackamas County uh, do our fire services. Yes. And, and I there is value in that committee. And we have two elected officials. They have two board members and administration and the fire chiefs meet together. So it's like a committee of sorts. And so I would recommend that that is one that we do need to have two elected officials participate with. All right. And let me ask uh, Councillor Garlington and Councillor Alexander, you're both serving on that. Do you find that a satisfactory uh, form of public service? Uh, satisfactory uh, rapport with, you know, Nick and Charles and all them and our meetings go really well and we, we advance and get things done. So. All right. Councillor Garlington, you're feeling about that? I'm willing to continue on that board. Yes. All right. Well, I think then that and that, uh, you know, I don't want to rock the boat. If things are going well, that's one where it looks like it's working and important during this transition time. So we will stick with that. Um, now, on the school district, uh, when I was on the city council five years ago, I did serve as a liaison to the to the school district. Uh, that was before we had mm, more than maybe once a year meetings with the district. We are hoping to have more frequent meetings with the school district, but sometimes scheduling conflicts make that difficult. Has anyone given thought to being a liaison to the school board? We haven't had a report back from the school board in two years. So, um, and in, in the <clears throat> two years that we have met with, or that I have been on council, we've had four scheduled meetings canceled from, from the side of the school district. Okay, so uh, perhaps having a liaison to be sure that things are communicated clearly from one meeting to the next is important. Uh, we'll continue to make the effort to have those joint meetings. Uh, I know that things have come up that have prevented them from happening in the past. Um, that's uh, one of the areas where uh, I found it was very helpful to serve. Um, Councillor um, Roberts, you had applied to be uh, a member of the school board. Um, are you interested in serving a liaison there? Um, I would be interested in taking on that role if there isn't another counselor more interested. Um, I think that they have an existing format where I believe Director Zimpbaum uh, watches all of our meetings, either live or recorded, and reports back to their board of directors. And so if it would be acceptable for me to follow the same form of not attending their meetings in person, but watching them either live or after the fact, then I would be interested in taking that role on. Okay, all right, that sounds like a good way to go. Thank you. All right, and so they have a liaison to us, essentially. Uh, I couldn't tell you if it's it's official, uh -huh. uh, but I do believe that that is a consistent every month. Okay. She reports back to them on their active standing. Very good. Um, we don't have liaison to the budget or audit committee, uh, uh, the budget committee we're all a part of, so it's not appropriate there. 
Um, I have um, served on the planning commission in the past, and that was one area where I thought I might like to uh, liaison myself uh, for those meetings where they are dealing with legislative matters, not land use matters. Uh, as you know, you all got an email this week uh, when the planning commission deals with something that is a, um, uh, they're adjudicating a land use matter, that matter might come to us on appeal. And it's important for us not to have different levels of information about it, which one would gain by attending the meeting itself. So we avoid uh, planning commission meetings that have land use uh, matters quasi-judicial hearings. Uh, but for the other meetings, sometimes it is good to have some communication. So if you don't mind, that is one where I would like to serve as the, uh, as the liaison myself. Uh, as far as the public works, uh, we also, the mayor served as the liaison to the storm and sewer infrastructure part of the public works. Um, she is no longer on the council, so that's one where we have an opening. Um, what's your pleasure there? Has anyone thought about that one? Do we know when they meet? When is your meet? I, I would suggest combining the one under public works that says storm sewer infrastructure in parentheses with Wes with the top one for regional committees. That's really what that one is about. So if someone's appointed to Wes C4 Metro, that really is covering the one that is under public works as well. Okay, so that's the regional committees. All right, well, that brings me, uh, Councillor Garlington, I know you attended by Zoom the C4 meeting and you had some things to share about that the last time you were here. Um, I don't want to overburden any particular uh, council member, but uh, have you given thought to your ability to serve on, on any of those regional bodies? I'm happy to help. I And I know you were on that meeting as well. I felt like there was a lot of mayors on that. I mean, there was a few... Uh, counselors but a lot of mayors and and i i would i would be happy to help but i would offer it to you first i mean i'm not i'm not in a position to offer but you know what I, you know what i mean i mean i would defer to you first but i would be happy to take on that that role if if you felt like a i could be of help and b um you didn't want to do it well, I raised it because um, at the time of that meeting, I had not yet been sworn in. And you are yeah. right. Most of the uh, most of the city officials who serve on that are mayors. There are right. one or two cities where, for whatever reason, the mayor has chosen not to participate and a council member has served in their place. I think that's the case with Happy Valley. Um, but um, you had expressed an interest, uh, at least in part of the business they were discussing. But I think um, it, it i um, they may be expecting a mayor to serve there. And for me, it's a matter of figuring out uh, what amount of time I have and which meetings I can attend. Fortunately, I understand yeah. a lot of these are alternating between in-person meetings and Zoom meetings, which can make it a little bit easier for me to work out my transportation and timing schedule. So um, I will, I will I go ahead and, yes. Just real quick, I think that C4 meeting they said is going to continue as a Zoom. And the other thing I wanted to note is that um, there was also a lot of counselors on there because mayors hadn't been sworn in yet. Yes. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I'm happy to be your backup. Why don't we tag team that one? All right. I will put Garlington as reserve on there. And, okay. um, and as we as we identify the issues that uh, are being focused on by these regional groups, it may be that you have a stronger interest in one than I do, and so yes. it, it might be there's a logical way to split that up as we as we move uh, further on. Yes. Now, yeah. um, okay, uh, Councillor Garling, you you also were the reserve liaison for the senior center, uh, working with a, a community services director, and. Uh, what would you say there? That is a really hard one for me because they meet at 3.30 in the afternoon and I work in Beaverton. So um, I think I'd rather stick with the, the fire, the, the fire uh, oversight committee, which already requires me to leave work fairly early on one day. 
And I'm going to I will give the senior center up to maybe somebody who works a little closer to home and Michael, that might be able to get there because it is a 3.30 in the afternoon meeting. Okay. Now, Councillor Reichel, you're interested in that one? I'm interested in, and I can make that work with my schedule. It actually fits. Very and well. Councillor Huckabee, are you as well? Oh, same. <laughs> of course. Okay. I can make 3.30 work. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to put um, VR and VH there too. Um, <laughs> And you can figure out if one of you is the lead and one of you is the reserve, but uh, I'm happy to have both of you. Um, that is an area where we have seen their work plan for the year. We know it's gonna be an exciting place. And they're expanding the scope of what they do. It fits in with a lot of what we talked about at our, at our session. Uh, uh, Councilor Huckabee, do you have more to say about it? I'm excited to work with Tiffany on her new vision of a community center. Very good. Yeah, All right. <laughs> well, that's good. It, it's, it's great to know that people are going into these things with some excitement as well. Um, let's see. Um, Councilor Garlington, this is another one where you are currently serving on the library as the library uh, liaison. Um, let me get your feelings. I don't want to replace somebody from something that the, some something where they're really enjoying it, but you and Councillor Alexander are the only two incumbent councillors we have. Uh, but I do want to ask you about that. Well, uh, I'm happy to continue there. I missed the meeting this last week um, or a few last Thursday. Um, work got in the way. I plan to watch that online. I know that um, there was a lot of other people there because there was some pretty hot topics, but. Um, I'm happy to continue with that. Uh, I, I think it's really important, too, that we go, you know, pay attention to that because there's a lot of stuff going on with um, the, the second build, which is the Oak Grove build. And I think it's really important that we stay in touch with that. Although Natalie from planning is also on that board and she reports back quite, quite a bit of information as well. So I'm, I'm happy to go there. You just let me know unless somebody else wants to do that. All right. Do we have another council member who's interested in serving maybe as a second on that uh, library board? Bef oh, I was just going to say before we fill all these positions too, I do want to throw it out there that we have an open seat on our council. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So either we fill them all or we talk about filling them all, but we also ideally would like to select someone at our next meeting when we'd be offic officially appointing these positions. And so we may leave one open and that just may be the luck of the draw they get, or perhaps we have someone who can fill more reserve roles, but well, I wanted to put that out there. That's a good Revisions, point. And yeah. I, I think I have a good sense of people's interest for most of these now. Uh, we'll take that into consideration when we do final appointments at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. And I see that our guest of honor has arrived. <laughs> so uh, I think this has been a helpful discussion. It's good to get this feedback. Um, and we will find appropriate places for people to be involved. Uh, and there may be even other things that come up that aren't even on here uh, that we'll think it's good to have some, some connection to. So uh, that's been a helpful process. And now we will return to item one. Um, <coughs> House District 40 representative, uh, Anessa Hartman. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hello. We'll wait, hello, till the presentation gets up. While that's getting loaded, I just want to say Mayor Milch, Council President Huckabee and Councilors, thank you for allowing us to have this time. For the record, my name is Vanessa Hartman and I am your state representative for House District 40, Gladstone, Oregon City and unincorporated Clackamas County. Um, and I just, um, we're gonna take this time to sort of share our priorities where we're at as of right now. Um, but before we begin, I wanna take a moment to introduce my chief of staff and allow them to introduce themselves for a minute. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Milch. Uh, council members, my name is Daniel Mulkey. I use he him pronouns. I am a um, son of immigrants. I, my mother was from Denmark. My dad's from Iran. Um, yeah, proudly first generation American. Um, proud to also have sort of an international lens to speak six languages, working on a seventh. 
Uh, yeah. So in I, his spare I, time. In, my, in all my spare time. <laughs> also studying for the bar in my spare time. So uh, yeah, I just graduated from law school in uh, the summer. So during that time, I, while I was in law school, I worked for Representative Power, um, worked as her legislative clerk for a couple of years, doing a lot of housing work, uh, labor work, different environmental uh, policies that I've, I've researched for her and then took over as her chief of staff before she left the legislature. So yeah, a lot of different policy interests, um, a lot of interests. So I take my cats to the Willamette uh, Veterinary Clinic on, <laughs> uh, in town here. So yeah, excited to, to be here and, and help the community. Thank you. Oh, look, it worked on the first click. Yay. Okay, so this is the agenda. We'll just run through it. Um, everyone's time is precious. Um, and I, But I just wanted to ground and acknowledge at the opportunity that we have at having a local um, who was previously a locally elected official in the state legislature, even in my short two weeks there, um, realizing that we have the most um, have served previously, whether it's school board, county commission, or at a local level in the state legislature now. And I want to say that because as we all can attest to, um, policies get passed without thinking about the impacts of our community and what we then have to deal with. And so um, I want everyone here to know that that is the lens that we will always take is um, how do these policies that we're either sponsoring or supporting or introducing affect local governments and affect you all and affect our citizens as well. Um, when the purpose for us today, um, I really um, want to make sure that our office works in coalition with all partners in the district. So elected officials, school board members, um, you all are my now conduits to the constituents in this area and, and making sure that you all know that we have an open door policy um, at any point in time. Um, I no longer have the time and luxury to, you know, peruse the Facebooks and see what sort of things that people are talking about. And so um, as we move forward in this session, please feel free to always reach out and let me know what is happening and is affecting Gladstone. Um, and so we are doing this with, with every, um, oh, I'm clicking here as if it's going up there. Uh, we are doing this with also Oregon City as well. And we met with the mayor on Friday um, and we'll be then um, going down to our school board level and um, discussing and seeing what pr priorities they have as well. Um, for this session, I have the honor of serving on four committees. Um, first is the Early Childhood and Human Services. Uh, second, I'm a member on the Housing and Homelessness Committee, as well as a member on the Information Management and Technology Committee. Um, and then I, I serve as vice chair for the Agriculture, Land Use, Natural Resources, and Water Committee. Um, we will be sharing these schedules out with everyone if you want to listen, as there are legislative priorities that affect Gladstone. We'll be sure to alert you all if there's a meeting that you need to attend to, and if you need help sort of signing on to the legislature to watch those meetings from afar, or if you want to come visit us, um, just let us know and we will make sure to help you on that. Um, in addition to these committees, I also serve as the vice chair um, on the state's BIPOC caucus for their um, community engagement as well as their internal engagement on policies that we all vote on as a priority for our caucus. Okay, so my legislative priorities, we are getting settled in the office. As I said, it's been 10 days, um, not that I'm counting or anything. Um, one of our staff members who cannot make it today, her name is Vanessa Robles. Um, she will be our constituent services and managing all things my calendar. Uh, and we'll be able to um, take on some casework um, and help kind of mitigate those um, situations. And so I'll be able to send her photo and, and bio you can use my email address because she manages that um, to contact her. So really, um, my legislative priorities really had centered around, you know, my lived experience, um, as well as the conversations that we heard with our constituents on the campaign trail. Um, growing up as a, um, in a single family, single mom um, and a low income household, a lot of my priorities sort of go through that lens on how that affects us. Um, so the three big ones and the three buckets is what I call them is infrastructure, working families, and human services. Um, and those bills that you'll see that we are sponsoring and supporting all fall within those three categories. Which brings us to 
my three priority bills as of right now, I told I should slow down, but you know, I don't do that. <laughs> um, so the three priority bills for me, um, the first one that I'll talk about is our campus sexual assault survivors. And this, this policy is um, in coalition with Every Voice Coalition. Um, and they brought this to us here. Oregon has the second highest rate of interpersonal violence in the country. And so what this, um, what they're proposing is uh, five, they call it the core five. And so it will provide free legal, medical and counseling services, confidential advising services, um, anti-retaliation protection, transparent public data, which is the big one, which I'm very excited for. And that will um, provide comprehensive anonymous collected data to ensure transparency and allow schools to identify vulnerable demographics. And we can use that data for, for further um, investigation. And the last one is annual evidence-based prevention and awareness programming. And so that one, um, all of the ones you're about to hear about, um, we all are in a legislative concept stage. So that means we've submitted them and we are just waiting for language to come back from legal counsel. Um, to help us um, sort of amend the drafts. And uh, once those are uh, finalized, we will share those with you all. The next one is one that I am very excited about, um, and it is Home Share for Oregon. And this is quite new, like a day old new, <laughs> that we signed on to it. Um, but basically what this is, is this program started about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and if you are a homeowner, let's say you're an empty nester and you have rooms to rent, or rooms available, and you are at risk of losing your home because you can no longer afford your mortgage, uh, you could rent your spare bedroom for $1,000 or less. And with that, you will be able to um, write off those taxes of up to $12,000, so up to $1,000 per month. And so with this, we heard testimony today from folks. Um, they're able to keep their homes. Um, the best part of this program is that they actually provide the service of pairing you up of matching you up with folks. So they go through this whole, it's like a dating profile. You go through this whole dating profile of home share and they will match you up and they will help you with interviews. They'll help you create leases. Um, they will uh, help, you know, sort of mitigate any issues that you might come across. And we've seen a really great increase in uh, for our senior population. Um, that is the majority of the population we see utilize this and they are able to share and have a, a roommate and still be able to keep their home as well as help folks who cannot afford um, some the astronomical rate, uh, rents that we have right now. Um, so with this, uh, we hope to see you know, this pass um, so that people can, we can expand on this program. Um, but the hope is to be creative in our um, housing supply shortage. This has a direct impact right now um, and we don't have to wait for houses to be built. Um, I, I will provide all one pagers for you all to have. Um, next. And I would be a bad state legislator if I didn't talk about tolling. <laughs> um, as you all know, it's number one priority for this district. Um, and we are trying to be very um, creative, I guess is the right word. And so we have introduced language that we have not received again back yet um, that will require ODOT um, to hold them accountable to their equity assessment. Um, and if there are any other reasonable alternatives after they find whatever they find in those findings. Um, and they will have to present that draft and in, as well as incorporate all of the public's comments um, and get consent from counties that are getting the proposed tolls in. So they will need to get consent from the county commissioners. Um, again, take that with a grain of salt as we work through the language and we haven't received that back. Um, but our goal is to make sure we hold them accountable to the equity statement, and that um, we also want to make sure that um, Gladstone, Oregon City and other cities are getting infrastructure dollars to fix uh, some of the issues um, that will inevitably happen. They happen right now. I mean, it took us forever to get over here. So um, that is sort of the way that we're approaching this. I will say that there are um, other legislators that are, we're trying to come together to work together on, on fighting this. So know that it is one of our main goals. <laughs> um, and then other, these next two slides are just additional sponsored bills. Um, these are not ones that I, um, these could be a mixture of ones that I either am chief sponsoring or co-sponsoring, um, but that fall into those three categories that I know the constituents of Gladstone uh, were, would be very interested in. And the very first one that you see that has an LC, which just stands for legislative concept, is probably one that we will take on as a chief sponsor, um, but it would establish uh, the public drinking water and sewer rate, pay, rate payer assistance fund. Basically similar to what we did with the ARPA dollars um, as we, we went through St. Vincent de Paul, I believe, I remember, um, this would make this 
this fund that dollars that we already have that are not ARPA dollars that would be consistent um, and allow low income residential households with bill back bill payment assistance. Um, so that one, that one is still in a legislative concept stage. Um, the color, the ones that are in green, I just sort of picked a couple to talk about. Um, HB 2257 would establish the school safety construction and appropriate money to the Department of Education. And basically what that means is um, cities that like Gladstone that have bonds um, that are needed for construction, this would actually create a sort of a grant program that schools like ours could apply for, like whether for, you know, mold mitigation or infrastructure improvements instead of putting out another bond um, to raise the taxes um, for our residents. So this would be able to, I think it's allocating 15 million around there um, so that our, our school districts could apply uh, for those construction, construction loans um, or construction grants, excuse me. Um, and then HB 2615 would expand our eligibility for the Promise Grant, um, which would allow our veterans to apply for the grant within 12 months of their discharge from military service um, at our Oregon Community Colleges. Uh, that one we had recently signed on to, and so we're still sort of learning the ins and outs of that. But um, being out on the doors, definitely having uh, veteran workforce and those additional uh, infrastructure needs for them was a big thing that we heard. Um, and then HB 2800 was, I don't know if that's in here, but um, was something that I was unaware of that Oregon does not identify or has not identified what uh, workplace age discrimination is. There's no, um, the no description about it. And so what this one does is define that um, and make it illegal for any employer to seek the age of an applicant prior to completing an initial interview. And we see this affecting mostly our senior population um, as they go back into the workforce. So we're excited about to co-sponsor on that one. Um, and then I don't need to read through all these, you guys can run <laughs> through them. Um, but I think the big ones for me, um, HB 2728 would expand our double up food buck pro program. Um, and if you're not familiar, it's basically if you qualify for SNAP, you can go to a certified uh, farmer's market and exchange $10 and receive $20 back. And they're able to use that money on fresh fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market. Um, and then that program, um, the farmer's market then goes back and gets reimbursed for those additional $10 they've provided. So it's a really great, uh, a really great program for, you know, our low income folks who deserve access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and then the last one, excuse me, I should have brought water. <laughs> Um, it's HB 2888, 89, excuse me, um, which establishes tools uh, to actually facilitate affordable and efficient housing production. Um, as you all probably know, some of our systems are very, very outdated. And so this would allow the speediness of the project as we uh, work to support the, the governor's emergency bill about 36,000 units per year. And so this would help facilitate that. And Second to last, uh, capital funding requests. Uh, we have the opportunity to advocate for funding requests, both for capital and for bond measures. And Administrator Beth has given me a list that, uh, <laughs> she's already given me a list, um, and that we will do our best to advocate for. Um, there's no promises, uh, but if I reach out and ask for any sort of testimony, like one of them would be uh, funding for the site plan for the uh, senior center. Um, to receive just testimony as to why it's important. Um, it would just be a written testimony about why that's important to our community. Um, we are doing with this, with this, the, the whole district. Um, and a lot of the ones that I'm advocating for are the transportation ones as well. Um, but if there are any funding requests, we do need them by the end of this week. Is that right? Ideally. <laughs> no rush. Um, if there's any addition to the ones that you sent me already. Uh, and lastly is our constituent services. So I talked a little bit about uh, Vanessa, did I say Vanessa's name? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, Vanessa, she will be the main point of contact for any sort of constituent needs. Um, one exciting thing, um, a part of the reason why I ran is making government accessible and actually helping speed along those processes. So we have now the opportunity to use the little title in front of my name to help speed up processes for any sort of casework that's happening within our district um, that needs sort of that needs support um, from, from government. So please feel free to reach out. Um, if we don't know the answer, we can't help, we will find the person too. And um, lastly, uh, Daniel will be the point of contact for all elected officials. Um, and so he will sort of manage that 
um, calendar of mine, our goal is to have monthly gatherings um, where we can hear and listen um, to any sort of issues that are top of mind that maybe you didn't talk about council meeting. Uh, but that's, that is the goal is to have those regular gatherings or town halls. Um, and yeah, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation <laughs> and Daniel's uh, contact information, which is my email, which everyone just utilizes. <laughs> um, with that, I can take any questions if you have any. Um, yeah. Do counselors have questions for Representative Hartman? Councilor Huckabee. I don't have any questions. Just thank you for coming and we're excited to work with you. Councilor Alexander? Yeah, I see. You got to heavy load on your shoulders there because i i saw how full that town hall was friday at the college and and not as many people talked about the tolling as i thought would but there were still you know a lot of people in the audience were talking about it they had those other subjects it's were all great subjects the students asking all that but i think it's pretty neat that we've got mark meek and you and both from gladstone mm -hmm. and then if you work with oregon city i think we should have enough you know, you guys have enough pull or say to get some other people excited about no toll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that would be everybody I talk to's priority. So good luck on that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I would just like to say thank you so much for coming and kind of giving us an overview of how much you are doing. Like that's crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. But all of it seems really exciting and it just feels like it's things that are long overdue. And um, I appreciate the work that you're doing for the community. So thank you for this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilor Roberts. I have no questions. Just want to thank you for the presentation um, and request a copy of it. I assume it'll go in the minutes, but if we can request a copy of it sooner. Thank you. And I think the uh, um, PowerPoint was actually sent to us in an email late today. So you should be able to get that. Um, we had our uh, our planning retreat uh, last weekend. And um, as you know, from having experienced that before, it can be very overwhelming to new city councilors to discover the scope of things that a city is responsible for. Uh, so help, thank you for helping us put that into perspective because <laughs> when we compare that to the things that come out at the state level, we see uh, you know, our, our focus is a little more narrow. Uh, but uh, one of the things that came up was the concern about um, um, you know, we use the term unfunded mandates, uh, laws that come out at the state level that then are imposed on local government uh, without necessarily the, the funds to help them. Um, I appreciate uh, your sensitivity to that. I appreciate uh, on the housing matter that you talked about, um, you know, that we've, I've spent a, a lot of years on planning commission working on changing uh, some of the rules to comply with state uh, uh, mandated housing requirements that allow people, will allow people, for example, to have uh, accessory dwelling units in their home. Uh, when my mother was in her 60s and 70s, I think she had uh, medical students, grad students living as uh, boarders in her home for a little bit of income, for some companionship, for someone who was there to do some heavy lifting occasionally. It's a great situation for a senior person. I'm glad that you're sponsoring legislation that will help them financially with that as well by uh, you know, making the income from that uh, exempt from a, a portion of their taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a creative way of looking at an issue that uh, you know, we're hoping that we, we build that, that a lot of these ADUs and uh, middle, missing middle housing gets developed in Gladstone, but uh, that's not all that's gonna help. And that kind of creative thinking to provide those additional incentives uh, is, is helpful and, and uh, part of the reason we elected you, <laughs> that we know that you would come up with ideas like that. Um, and, uh, and the other legislation, we're looking forward to following it through and seeing how it, how it plays out. And, uh, uh, I will echo what Councilor Alexander said. We are very grateful to have Gladstone representatives uh, in our state legislature. It's it's really wonderful to have you there. Uh, so thank you for both for coming. Mayor Milch, I'm yeah. not sure if Councilor Garlington has. Oh, yes, anything. that's right. I apologize that's for okay. that. Yes, see, if I don't look at the screen, Councilor Garlington, I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say congratulations. I hope you're having a great time. I mean, just take it all in too. It's a great, it's a great time in your history. So congratulations again. I, I just want to go run, run by that tolling because I have been to quite a few meetings in the last uh, couple of weeks 
And one of the things that was said was that the legislature has voted twice to direct ODOT in moving forward. And many people in our community, and I'll say community be, meaning Clackamas County, feel that the, our only recourse at this point is a vote. And um, I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thank you, Councillor Garlington. Yes, um, and I think I want to acknowledge that I am just one vote. Uh, and, and and I no, definitely- I know, yeah. I know. No, 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 I, I, I think, you know, just, Acknowledging that uh, we can take a firm stance on that, um, but we need to be able to whip up the votes to get the entire legislation to agree to that. Um, our plan in this, because the legislators have already voted twice on moving this forward, and we right. are at a at an impasse, which we've all heard, where we need funding for our roads. Um, and this was their solution in 2017. Um, but what didn't take into account was doing that equity statement ahead of time and seeing the actual impacts that they still have not done. And so as they uh, do their equity and environmental impact statement, um, it will show them the issues that we will all face. Uh, there are residents that can afford a tolling. Uh, but our issue is making sure that it is fair and that the people have a voice in this, which we can all attest to that hundreds and thousands of people have said no to this. And so our goal is to hold them accountable to what they said that they were going to do and then allow the elected officials to vote on that consent of that um, of those findings. And so it would, our plan, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, our plan is to get those findings and we will all see what that is. Um, and then it will go to the county commissioners to vote whether or not to move forward. Right. Okay. I hear that. I think, and I don't speak for anyone else on the council when I say this, I think one of my stances has always been that if, if they were going to toll, then toll all of us. Why just us? Why Clackamas County? I mean, yeah. Gladstone doesn't even have enough money for sidewalks. Why are you making us pay this it's it's just not it's not fair not fair that we have we don't have to pay it i'm happy to pay my share i'm just not happy that i have to pay everybody's share that that's my issue with that and then the other one i wanted to just say out loud really quick I, I, could you pay attention to that house bill three i think it's 3088 the one that would legalize um um essentially brothels in the state of Oregon. <laughs> um, I'd like for you to pay attention to that. I, I, I am paying attention to it. Um, it concerns me a lot as uh, a mother and um, for many other reasons that I won't go into that I think that things, uh, things like this legislation like this it leads to nothing good ever. Um, and I'll, I'll, I plan to fight it, and I hope you'll be on that side with me. Um, like I said, I don't think it has anything good to bring forward to anybody in the state of Oregon. So anyway, with that, have a great time. Take it all in. Meet new friends. And I hope you, I hope you enjoy every moment of this. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Garlington. Uh, we have taken note of that. I'm not familiar with that, um, but we'll, we'll look into it. Can I just ask one more I, about the toll? It's about the tolling again, because that's the big <laughs> issue. But do you hear like like you're up there now in Salem? So do you or down there? Do you hear? Is that what they're talking? Is that talked about or they just don't? It's not that big of an issue to them. Or I mean, what is that? Um, because we found out Friday it's it's definitely not federal. It's only state because I got the answer I got. Yes. No, I, I <laughs> the discussion has not come to the floor as a whole yet oh, okay. it is coming um there are things that we are waiting for from odot um that might answer a lot of our questions oh, okay. and we don't have a timeline on when we're going to receive that information mm -hmm. um but they are having conversations um i would recommend uh paying attention to the transportation committee uh because it's the number one topic and i think it was last thursday i believe they meet um they had a really really heavy discussion and i think some of the legislators that are serving on that committee asked some really really good questions to odot um and they're holding them accountable for sure. Okay, I unfortunately don't serve on that uh, right. committee, but I, 
um, would encourage you to add that to your calendar and continue to submit testimony. As, Which one's that? Um, it's the transportation committee, and I believe they meet on they believe they meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I'm not quite sure what time. But I can send you the link. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they're, I mean, they're aware that there's people out there that are, that are doing initiatives to get signatures to get it on. Uh, yeah, way. I don't think that the, a day has gone by where I haven't heard the word. Totally. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. what, just want to make sure because that's everybody's <laughs> biggest concern there. It is, yes. No, and it's, it is, um, it is our top priority. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, and that's, why, that's why she's hearing about it every day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're right. bringing the discussion very seriously. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking to offices every day about, about tolling and our plan for tolling and, and really bringing that conversation front and center and in, in the building. Yeah. And Representative Hartman, I remember you as a counselor who always did her homework. I know you're doing a lot of reading as a part of this job. I'm going to recommend a book, as I've done to you before. Uh, the, the, the chair of the Metro Commission, Lynn Peterson, has a new book out about transportation. Um, I bought it because I thought it was more about policy. It turned out to be uh, a great deal of focus on equity in transportation policy, uh, the freeways that tear communities apart. Uh, the uh, attempts to correct that, which also tears communities apart, as we're seeing in the Portland region right now, uh, and to some extent in our region as well. Um, I think you would find it a very good read. You would definitely find an ally in your concern about equity in transportation policy uh, in uh, uh, Commissioner Peterson. So uh, I commend that to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Milch. I'm still working through the other list. of books. <laughs> um, And now I have to refresh up on a lot of land use and agriculture and water <laughs> resources. So uh, lots of reading these days. So Well, if anyone is capable of doing it, it is you. We are <laughs> proud that you are our representative. We are grateful to you for coming to us. Uh, I use we collectively. I'm, I I'm apologize. I've not polled the board on the, the council on this, <laughs> but I hope that I speak for the city. Uh, staff, any other other comments? Uh, I think you have one more thing for Representative Hartman. I do. Um, last month uh, in December, your last meeting here, uh, we were all still keeping our fingers crossed that maybe you would be able to serve in both capacities. So uh, we didn't do for you what we might have done for uh, uh, you know someone else who was a little more definite about her situation. But we got a letter of resignation this month and we regretfully <laughs> accepted it and wished you well on it. And we have one more presentation <laughs> we would like to make if you could come forward. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so here's a plaque. I will read it for the camera. Gladstone, Oregon, the city of Gladstone and city council expresses their sincere appreciation to Anessa Hartman for outstanding service to the Gladstone community as a member of the Gladstone city council, January, 2021 to January, 2023. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you all so much again for taking the time today and uh, let's do some good work. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for coming. Yes. Thank you. Um, we generally don't have business from the council or anything else. I just, let me check though, if there's anything that we have forgotten or want to go back to uh, Councillor Huckabee. One thing that I did want to make sure we follow up on when we discuss um, liaison positions again is the Clackamas County Research Justice Study. Okay, you had expressed an interest in that, I think through an email I saw. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, we will definitely keep that one on the list. Perfect. Thank you. All right, uh, is there a motion to adjourn the um, work session? So I have a question. Yes, question. Councillor Garlington. I wanted to go back to the council liaison appointments as well. Okay. Um, I was wanting to ask a question of Administrator Betts on the um, the water board that we are chairing. Do you attend those meetings? Staff does not attend those meetings. I've been in contact with the director of NCCWC. He actually was watching the last council meeting. He understands that we have not made an appointment. He said they have an alternate that is able to chair their meetings until February when Gladstone does make an appointment for that. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really concerned about that board in that we it, it does, number one, it puts us at a chair 
And number two, it's an enormous part of our city, um, what, how our city governs, uh, that, that basically, you know, our water and our sewer are big number one huge topics. Um, Councillor Tracy was super knowledgeable in that seat. And I'm not saying that, um, I'm sorry, Luke, I forgot your last name because I really have Robert. taken too much cold medicine today. <laughs> um, I just, I'm, I'm just, I, I want to know, I want to hear out loud somebody's, cons if, if, should we be really concerned that we, uh, that we don't have a big enough, uh, that we should have a, a, a person from the staff at that meeting as well. What, what are your thoughts? I mean, I just, I'm not really sure, I guess, how important those meetings are. Unfortunately, I thought, wow, Matt Tracy is really knowledgeable. He does a great job. He always came back, told us what we needed to know and everything was good. So you know, it's it's another one of those kind of like C4. And I said to Mr. Milch, wow, I should have paid more attention to that meeting. Damn, you always <laughs> went to. They have a lot to say. So I, I guess I'd just like to hear more about what does that board do? What does it mean to Gladstone? And um, kind of like C4, I guess I have a handle on that. Anyway, I'm going to hand it back to Jackie. Can you wrap my head around that a little bit? Well, we can have a side conversation on that as well. I don't have the intergovernmental agreement with me, but basically you've got two members from Oak Lodge Water Services, one member from Gladstone City Council, and two from Sunrise Authority. They meet quarterly. They have an executive director. We are in a phenomenal partnership right now with no issues there. From a staff perspective, we don't attend those meetings, but we do have staff in the Public Works Department that is at a staff level with those agencies. So we are connected there. Okay. But if you wanted to look at minutes on their website to get a flavor for how those meetings are going, but I, I'm not convinced that that is one where staff needs to participate. It is an elected officials group. I did attend the last C4 subcommittee meeting because I know Gladstone was not represented and I'm trying to shadow as many as I can to make sure that I'm there, but I my capacity is gone as well. Um, but I'm not concerned with okay. NCCWC. And like I said, Councilor Tracy is also willing to have those conversations with anybody if you'd like further information. And, and if Councillor Roberts thinks that he can take that on, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, you know, talk out loud about it a little bit. And I, and I wish I'd have had time this last week, but I had kind of a rough this last week. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, and I'll just add to that. Uh, you know, we are leaving open the possibility of having a couple people involved in some of these liaison positions. I know that a couple of the people who have expressed uh, interest in perhaps uh, applying for the opening on the city council are also people who have experience uh, and interest in water-related issues. So uh, it may be this is another case where uh, someone else uh, with the proper background and qualifications would be uh, available to serve in that capacity alongside Luke. Uh, if that's the uh, Council Roberts, if that's the appointment we make. So, um, uh, but I appreciate your sharing that concern and uh, your awareness of the importance of it as all these uh, liaisons are important. Uh, but the ones that involve a little more sophistication and areas that are kind of outside the purview of most of us as just ordinary citizens in the community. Um, I'm grateful that we have the offer of our, our, of our current representative or former representative there to help in that transition. So I hope that will happen. All right, I'll ask again, do we have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so moved. I'll second. All right. Councillor Roberts moved, Councillor Alexander seconded that we adjourn the meeting. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councillor Huckabee. Yes. Councillor Alexander. Yes. Councillor Reichel. Yes. Councillor Roberts. Yes. Councillor Garlington. Yes. Mayor Melch. Yes. Uh, the meeting is adjourned at 6.54 uh, p.m.